Great, thank you, everybody. So, Rick, it looks like we've got some pharmaceutical therapeutics, we've got research software, those are the, the highest numbers, but we also have devices, digital health, medical and life sciences, and engineering. Great. Awesome, thank you, everybody. Thank you. So, we're gonna go ahead and get started today. I'd like to introduce Rick Howe with IQ Lab. You can see his logo there behind me. Rick is the presenter and the sponsor for today's event. Rick, I'm gonna make your um, camera be the spotlight video. Okay. And you can go ahead and start sharing your screen whenever you're ready. All right. Um, let's see. Is this looking okay? Yes, we can see it. I mean, to be honest, I'd rather not be the spotlight, but <laughs> it's how it goes. Um, so I hope everyone is doing okay. Uh, normally, uh, I do this kind of things um, in in person. Uh, that's what I prefer to do. I can gauge the reaction a little better. But you know, we live in strange times. Um, so today's talk about is about pivoting, and you know, people. Uh, usually associate uh, pivot with with failure, and you know. But you know, I mean, the the logic is that you don't need to pivot on, unless it's not something's not working, right? But uh, you know, we we we'll explore some ways where you know that's really okay, uh, and um, sometimes um, pivoting could also even be a sign that uh, you're going in the right direction. So the uh, <clears throat> the general um, Spirit of the presentation is that pivoting is is change, but sometimes sometimes change is good. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, sorry about this COVID hair. Um, I have this Sasquatch on my shirt because um, I kind of look like a Sasquatch, but you know, Bigfoot is a big thing in Portland, so maybe I, I fit in. It's okay. <laughs> uh, I uh, have about 20 years of experience in uh, building and launching products and more in the web IoT uh, sphere, um, and, but multiple industries, uh, finance, medical, bioscience even, um, HR, all kinds of different places. And that's essentially my background. Uh, some of those products have uh, failed and others have been um, purchased by larger companies things have gone public. So um, uh, about seven years ago, I decided to uh, form an IQ lab to specifically help startups um, uh, stepping through the, their journey and try to avoid some of the common uh, mistakes uh, that I've seen uh, in my career. But, but um, I, uh, this is uh, my first time talking about in, in a bioscience specific crowd. I know uh, some of them, some of you are doing devices, and some of you are making maybe inventing new drugs. Uh, hopefully, uh, vaccines for all COVID. Um, but uh, I mean, I, that's not my expertise. So uh, I will try to say high level, uh, so that it stays more relevant. Hopefully, some of my uh, experience that I can share with you are still relevant. Um, and uh, you know, I want to keep this a little bit more interesting because it's remote. Uh, it's hard to gauge your reaction. So I'm going to try to inject a bit of uh, 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 80s movie magic <laughs> to, to, keep, uh, to try to capture your attention. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Maybe, uh, maybe the jokes land, maybe they don't. We'll see. Um, all right. So uh, before we start uh, about talking about pivoting, there's a common uh, journey for, for entrepreneurs in general, right? You know, uh, we want to introduce uh, something new to the market, but nobody wants to pivot uh, if they don't have to, uh, usually, right? Uh, so you pivot so that you don't have to uh, shut down your company. And there are few things that, you know, many things, unfortunately, actually, uh, that, that could lead to that. And um, <clears throat> some of them are more obvious. Um, maybe obvious is not the right word. Some of them you can kind of see as it's happening. Um, and you know, things like running out of money, usually yeah, you, you kind of see it coming. Uh, mismatch co-founders, um, 
that's a, that's a, that's a doozy. Uh, so a lot of times you can see that right from the get go. Um, there's nothing that crashes a company faster than two co-founders that don't have a shared uh, vision or um, a poor division of labor. But but that's that's a different topic for a different time because that's that's a whole thing on its own. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes you come out and you build your requirements uh, based on the, the needs of one or two larger benefactors or larger clients thinking that that will launch your company. But um, sometimes those requirements match up with the rest of the market. Sometimes they don't. So um, there are other things like, you know, well, maybe you're prototyping and you're eager to launch to uh, the product to the market, but then, you know, it's built on unstable technology and uh, when adoption starts, it, it kind of explodes or sometimes the product is good, but, you know, uh, the competition took notice and um, you couldn't reach the market fast enough. Um, but <clears throat> these are the points that these are the things that you can kind of figure out as you go and you can kind of see the trend and kind of respond to it. And today we're going to talk to uh, talk a, a bit more about um, things that may not be so obvious, you know, I mean, things that you kind of sense, you know, something's not quite right. Maybe the market is not um, responding or the users are not responding. Um, <clears throat> so in the next uh, four slides, which is um, the main bulk of this, this, this talk presentation, I'll attempt to break it down into uh, four categories I, I see where um, you may uh, identify potential uh, pivots, uh, different areas you can think about pivoting um, so that you don't, you know, ideally avoid going out of business. Okay, so the first thing is, you know, um, you know, we as entrepreneur, you know, we, we, the, we're eager to bring new values uh, and new experiences um, to, to stand out from, you know, whatever uh, products and services that's out there that we think we can do better. And uh, um, sometimes we uh, focus on specific persona, like, okay, a lot of times I'm the user and I want to make my life easier. So I want to make something better. But um, these pivots don't always happen just because of the type of product that, the, that you're making uh, or the, the type of the, the users that you're focusing on. A lot of times, um, it's that that it's it's is that it's that your assumptions, um, even if they're made correctly, they've they've changed over time. So <clears throat> some of the uh, pivoting uh, uh, happens when you future proof your product. Um, uh, we uh, look at. Um, the assumption where they, they shift uh, and some of these can happen very quickly. And I don't know how biosciences is um, in general, but you know, there, there are situations where in the matter of a year or two, uh, the market completely changes. So um, uh, a few years back, not, not too long, I would say five years back, um, we have a, a potential client that came in and his background uh, is in operations. He works with companies like Macy's and Nordstrom to uh, create opportunities for, for seasonal workers. And one of the pain points that uh, he has, the reason that he wanted to become an entrepreneur is there isn't a specific app or space organized, kind of like a LinkedIn or uh, like a job posting for seasonal workers. And it's difficult because uh, you don't want to post things on Craigslist and just have people come off the street and you want to have some recommendations, but there uh, aren't that many dedicated places for that. So he came in and um, we did a, a thing called a, a product discovery uh, with him. And then what product discovery is, is we look at the market trends and you know what his assumptions are and try to figure out if there's a product there. And interestingly enough, even, even Back then, uh, uh, Macy's and Nordstrom's already sort of in a decline. People are shopping more and more online. So uh, at the end of the discovery, um, we uh, 
discouraged him uh, from actually uh, uh, pursuing this this opportunity. And sure enough, in a, in a short few years, these uh, demands are kind of vanished as more people go away from brick and mortar. Now, if we had continued with that, that pivot, um, you could potentially eventually lead to an app like TaskRabbit or something like that. Uh, but um, I guess the point is that sometimes, you know, pivot can lead to uh, not building anything at all. But I think that's okay, especially right at the beginning. So future proving, thinking about uh, where your product is going, how your users are going to use it. Uh, and no one can truly predict the future, uh, but think about those things uh, would help. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> sometimes uh, pivot can happen even when uh, your product is, is perfectly fine. And uh, um, it's, it's not what's stopping people from, from using it. Uh, but, you know, we can take the environment uh, that your product requires to, to be functional for granted, right? As an entrepreneur, we kind of set up, we tend to have this uh, rose eye, a rose glass uh, on, you know, think about the, the, the base ca best case scenario. We kind of have to do that as entrepreneurs really to, to see the upside, but um, sometimes um, it's, it's not so, so, so simple. So like, you know, uh, a product that's introduced, especially to a larger organization, um, there may be requirements like security related requirements, uh, you know, IT requirements sometimes that uh, can lead to you thinking about, well, how do I, how do I position myself? And, you know, is this still worth it? Can it, can it, does it have a, uh, a chance to survive in that kind of environment? And I think uh, many of you who come from the, the, uh, the industry that you come from uh, would understand, would have a good understanding of this, but it's uh, worth mentioning. Um, and the other thing uh, that people typically forget is, uh, outside of the target audience, um, it's important to think about who's actually going to open the wallet, right? So um, what are their requirements? Uh, if you don't speak to them, like sometimes it's uh, talking to executives, right? Uh, and sometimes it's a matter of uh, meeting some of the requirements in order for uh, you to, uh, to continue your passage uh, of your product in introducing them into an organization. And that may not be a huge pivot, but uh, and maybe the core function still stay the same, but this is something to think about, um, you know, the people who uh, are buying versus the people who are using uh, might be two different, two different people. And uh, the last thing is uh, it's um, <laughs> a big assumption that, that, that we have as entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurs is that whatever we build, because it's clearly better, uh, you can just replace whatever people are using currently. And that may not always be sort of a safe uh, assumption, even if your product does um, provide better value or is cheaper. Um, so uh, there's a, <clears throat> we have another uh, client who came from insurance background and he manages uh, a lot of independent uh, insurance agents. And he wanted to, he was tired of buying um, insurance leads from sketchy websites. Um, so he wanted to create a platform that matches, you know, people who need insurance with uh, independent, independent insurance agents who can meet the, some of the requirements, like including pricing or uh, how far the agent is or, you know, services, that kind of stuff. Um, and it, make, it makes sense. And we thought um, the trouble, the, the most difficult part of uh, that enterprise is that it will be difficult to get users to come on board, the customers, because you have to compete with, you know, Geico and, and other like AAA or big insurance companies like that. And that's, that was true. Um, but what ended up, <laughs> uh, creating uh, more of a difficulty really was, was on the, the agent side. And um, because our entrepreneurs took it for granted that you know, he wanted to use this thing, so he would use it. But in a lot of uh, work settings, 
um, it was simply difficult to switch over to another web app. Sometimes it's blocked by the IT and uh, sometimes it's just not because the, the experience more is, is poor with a new thing. It's that they have to learn a new way of doing it. And even if it's better, people tend to choose uh, legacy or outdated software because of familiarity. Um, so that was, that was interesting and, and a good, good lesson and that you know, had to be changed. Um, okay, so <clears throat> the, the audience is a big one, right? So uh, we usually start with um, a very specific idea of who our users are. And uh, um, you know, when, when, when they're not responding, uh, sometimes it's not about changing the feature so that they can respond better, right? So um, who are your champions? So this is interesting because uh, in my experience, uh, what we observed is that sometimes the people who use your product are not the biggest champions of your product. It's the other people who work with the people who <laughs> use your product because you made their life much easier. Um, so when that happens and you see that, you know, your target audience is not giving you the same kind of uptake as you expect, um, it may be an opportunity to shift who, who your, your core audience is, right? Because you, you might find that, oh, it turns out it's not, a, it's not the sales team that loves this, it's the HR team because you provided uh, a better recruitment process or better uh, candidate, uh, uh, candidate uh, information. I don't know, maybe you know, something like that, right? So um, it, it sometimes it's just, it's these other things, other pockets of people um, that are secondary users, but who end up become the primary. So uh, that's, something interesting to think about. <clears throat> Who pulls the trigger? And this is re related to, to the last slide, um, you know, the, the decision maker. And uh, sometimes they love it so much that you, you end up building uh, a suite of tools just to upsell to them. And, uh, and your target audience becomes more of a, uh, a data provider. So um, we have experience where um, the executives love their dashboard so much, you know, that the product ended up more, more about uh, business intelligence rather than uh, these other things that other users are doing inside the system, even though all of this eventually lead up to the business intelligence. Um, <clears throat> so uh, who pulls the trigger can uh, potentially change uh, the way you position um, your product based on the, the shifting audience. Um, and then, you know, who are the real gatekeepers? Uh, so we think of gatekeepers as, you know, obviously someone who pays for um, the service or product, they're the gatekeepers. But in a, a larger um, uh, enterprise environment, we find that a lot of times in order for you to uh, put something into uh, the ecosystem, it requires a great a deal of um, consensus. Um, you know, if you uh, bring in something big in, sometimes they, you need to get buying from products, sometimes you need to get buying from finance, sometimes you need to get buying from IT uh, for security, and sometimes, you know, it's all of them, right? So um, thinking about around those things, uh, you know, what, what, what they need also in order to make their lives easier. Maybe they're not the primary, primary audience, but thinking in those lines will reduce uh, friction for you to introduce uh, uh, your product and services into uh, a larger business. So uh, we uh, recently built uh, uh, a fulfillment software for uh, a smaller company who uh, was purchased by a, a larger company, a much uh, bigger multi-billion dollar. Uh, it's actually in bioscience industry. And uh, um, we were, for a while, we were puzzled um, that, you know, because this fulfillment software is faster uh, and uh, more responsive and has better uh, customer service experience, why wouldn't they just replace their main uh, fulfillment software with uh, 
with this custom built uh, more modern solution, uh, it, it, it turns out that um, the, the reason that they stayed with uh, ACP, which is the, the, the one that they're currently using, is because uh, that's a requirement from a finance department, you, you're not even from the, the fulfillment uh, folks. It's, it's that they need to know from every corner of earth <laughs> what every branch is doing. And uh, uh, it really is not about uh, velocity or speed or uh, anything like that. It's about uh, centralized control, right? Um, so what we had to do is work with SAP and then um, report to it uh, so that um, for the people who use the software, they can benefit from it. But, you know, we're not going to try to replace the main, main, main things because SAP meets other bigger requirements that, that uh, we didn't get to see, we didn't have uh, ability to, to see into. So that um, changes things as well. And then uh, finally, uh, <coughs> pivoting on product. This is a big, big uh, deal for entrepreneurs. Nobody, nobody wants to really pivot on product. That means that you know uh, the feature you're building are are not uh, not working, and uh, that it's it's usually a, a big blow. Uh, but um, sometimes you know pivoting in a way is is doesn't have to view in that way. It could be viewed as refocusing your strength, right? Uh, so, um, so for example, uh, it's not uncommon uh, that, like I said, your SAP uh, example, uh, that you feel like it's better, but um, there are factors outside of just product feature alone uh, that, that prevents you from doing it. So maybe there are you can focus, pivot on the features that you want to build to coexist uh, with what's out there. Um, and um, sometimes you feel like, well, if uh, your comp competition does something, you should do it too. It's kind of a, a, a playing chicken kind of, you know. The, the problem there is that um, a lot of times they are better capitalized, right? They, they've been around for a while, a while longer. Uh, they have uh, uh, more money behind them and more resources. So uh, trying to uh, be innovative on a few things and, and, and meet feature parity with your competition, sometimes that's not the best use of your time or it could potentially you know, lead to running out of money and other things like that. Um, so knowing sort of the strengths and weaknesses of your competition and and, and, and your, yours um, is a more pragmatic way to compete without, you know, sort of burying your head in the sand, so to speak. And, uh, you know, remove anything that, that is noise, right? So to, to stand out in the market, and this is less about uh, uh, pivoting on specific features, it's more about uh, shedding things that you don't need, but that, also helps your positioning and um, helps you uh, uh, figure out what you want your customers to, to focus on. Um, and you know, earlier on, I would say that for to any entrepreneur, don't uh, fall in love too much with any single idea. Um, of course, if you set out to solve a problem, uh, you should solve that problem. <laughs> but that's not what I mean by falling in love with a single idea, you know, the way that you reach to us, you, the way you reach a solution or um, the way you bring your customer to a solution, uh, try not to get too fixated. Um, and, and sometimes other things uh, will speak to you as the process of discovering, um, you know, your product along with your, uh, your customers and their, their needs. So <clears throat> just to summarize, um, uh, don't think that there can be only one. Uh, competitions is good and sometimes coexisting with them is better. Um, so uh, just because I'm the user doesn't mean that I'm ready to, to buy. So that's something to think about. Um, and uh, don't try not to, to avoid this idea that uh, it works for me uh, and in my environment and therefore it necessarily 
works for everybody. And, and you know, most importantly, I think the general um, spirit of this talk, like uh, what I said in the Be Water, is that um, don't think that anything you launch is a, a holy grail, that that's the, the thing, that's it. Uh, you know, the market and needs uh, constantly shift. Uh, so pivoting along with these uh, changing market needs um, is, is important to, to survive and, and to actually uh, continue to bring value. So um, before I end the talk, there's you know, another way to, to look at pivoting. Um, you know, pivoting is in some ways think about, think, you can think about it as uh, uh, changing a product and services for the, the underserved. Right, so the uh, under uh, undiscovered opportunities, I, I guess. Right, check your assumptions uh, along the way. Um, you know, co coincides with don't fall in love uh, with uh, too many specific ideas. Um, think about <clears throat> sometimes you get to a point where uh, there there are bigger uh, opportunities that that is outside of your initial assumptions, right? So um, let me uh, think, the, the one example I can think of is that uh, we had a, a client that wanted to create um, uh, another app uh, to allow uh, social influencers to, to make affiliate dollars more easily on, on Amazon. Now Instagram already does this, so you know, it, didn't, it didn't make sense. Uh, to, to do that, but in the process of you know discovering uh, what those things uh, need, um, what came out of it is that uh, it turned out the Amazon merchants, the people who uh, are merchants on Amazon, are the underserved uh, audience. They they have the money to spend, but they don't have um, a marketing team. They certainly don't know how to go out there and find uh, influencers uh, very easily. They don't have the bandwidth. They're willing to pay for it. So. It turned out uh, that um, that was that was the pivot uh, needed. So focusing more on the um, Amazon merchant was was what made made it work. So um, not everything requires pivoting, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think you know if you're close to your products that you're building, um, I think the best way I can think of it is just in part listen to the the, the people and the data. Uh, and uh, uh, listen to sort of your tuition. Sometimes it's not um, a big thing that you have to pivot. Sometimes it's just like something a little bit small, a little bit new um, that makes it work. Um, Facebook uh, only took uh, relationship status, right? Uh, I mean, obviously it's a lot more than that, but, uh, but that's sort of the spirit, um, especially there's more more of those opportunities at the beginning uh, of your entrepreneurial journey. And uh, as you gain uh, critical mass, uh, that, that becomes less and less uh, possible. Um, so, you know, uh, take this time, if, if you're early on in your journey, to, to think of those things. I think it's well worth it. So to wrap this up, um, uh, I think, you know, uh, people think about pivoting like a dirty word, but I think it really it's in line with the entrepreneurial spirit, right? It is a, um, it's an innovation, a mini innovation within innovation itself. Uh, so it's like an innovation inception. <laughs> uh, so you wanna wanna make them early. Uh, you want to learn from it uh, quickly, and uh, um, and then um, you know. You iterate uh, just like everything else. In my uh, 20 years of uh, startup experience, I've never, uh, I've never seen a company that ended up succeeding exactly the way that they imagined at the beginning. Uh, I have uh, clients that's been with us for more than six years, and and they're really now coming up to speed. But they pivot four or five times uh, massively, not just small ways, and. Uh, uh, they learn the lesson each each way each each one of these pivots, and then uh, they push towards the next uh, next plateau or next uh, peak. So, um, it, pivoting, iteration, failure—they all go hand in hand. Uh, I just want to uh, 
leave you with this idea that uh, failure is an option and just, you know, it's not a dirty word, it's okay. Uh, and um, uh, that's, that's it, that's uh, my talk. Thanks for, for joining me. Hi, Rick. It's Renee. Thank you so much. This was really great. Um, we really appreciate your, uh, your expertise on this subject. And uh, if anybody has any questions for Rick, you can either put them in the chat or if you want to down at the bottom of your screen in the presentation um, control panel, there's a reaction button. You can click on that and you can raise your hand or, or a clap or make some sort of a reaction and I'll be able to see that. And then I can open up your microphone and you can ask your question yourself. So um, this is really interesting, especially um, Rick, your, your failure is an option and not to be afraid to fail and not to be afraid to change what you're doing because you never know if maybe that turns out to be the, the greatest thing that, that exactly. could have happened. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that, that people want so badly to make whatever their initial idea was work that they push and push and, and maybe lose the, don't, don't see the forest for the trees. Yes, that sometimes can happen. And sometimes that works. I'm not saying that, you know, uh, the, uh, the drive and, and uh, perseverance is, is not needed here. It's absolutely needed, but uh, it's helpful. To, I mean, we all work hard, you know, by default entrepreneurs have to work very hard, but, you know, work hard in areas that make sense, I think uh, is, is sort of the key here. Um, mm -hmm. And that what makes sense can change. So. Yeah, absolutely. So if anyone has a story of a way that they have pivoted in their business, maybe they started off doing one thing and thought maybe they, you know, pivoted to doing something else and it worked out for them or it didn't work out for them, let us know. Looks like we have a question from Darren. He says, what is most helpful to ensure you don't fall in love with your initial idea and vision? but to ensure that you're open to appropriate pivot options? That's a great question. And uh, uh, it depends on which what stage you're in. If you already have a customer uh, or many customers, uh, then you have to take um, their feedback to your change somehow, you know. Um, but earlier on, um, before we start any uh, code really uh, when we build product for our clients. The first thing is we flash out the experience as much as possible. Um, you just even in a clickable demo. And so it's not just a conceptual thing, but something that you can see and feel. Um, and doing clickable demo is cheap. It's just images, but then you kind of help you understand what that experience is. And so you can put a lot of your assumptions into that initial clickable demo and then show it to the people that you want um, you want them to use uh, the, the people that your audience basically and and see what their feedback is and um, it's helpful uh, sometimes that uh, you're not the one who's getting the feedback from them so that they can tell somebody truthfully or even have someone else doing the, the demo for you um, and you know, it's, it's best to have, it, it's, you know, building product is kind of like you're the artist, you're vulnerable when you put it out there. Uh, our tendency is to be more defensive, like, okay, I don't, uh, I, I'm, I'm putting myself out there and, you know, you should be right. But uh, the truth is it's a, uh, you're providing a service, right? And it's about you for sure, but it's also about the end user. So um, to be able to get, um, their feedback earlier on uh, will help you orient yourself a little bit better and you may, maybe you will change your mind as well. Mm -hmm. And Darren, if you have anything you'd like to add to your question, feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask it of Rick. Um, yeah, thank Rick. Thanks Rick, that was helpful. Um, and I appreciate your feedback about not 
maybe uh, being the one that hears the feedback directly, partly because you might get defensive, I suppose, but also because the person providing the feedback may be uh, less candid if it's coming to you exactly someone, someone they know who is the artist <laughs> the inventor so yeah that that makes a lot of sense thank you yeah that's a good point um having a third party prevent presenting that information to and doing the market analysis could be really helpful um you might get a better response rate that way Tanya has a question as well, Rick. Sure. She asks, um, Rick, do you work with biotech companies? And if so, do you see any distinct pivot patterns in that sector versus other sectors? Yeah, we do. So um, our biggest bioscience client uh, is BD. Uh, that's one of the ones I mentioned earlier. Uh, they have offices all over the, the world. Um, but it is a, a huge, uh, it's a complex question, not, not in, in the question itself. It's that something like a bioscience company, uh, the nature of the product, uh, the bio uh, is so diverse, you know, uh, even within a BD, BD itself, um, uh, a huge department. They started out building medical instruments and devices. So the bread and butter is syringes and uh, you know, surgical instruments, those things uh, have to follow heavy uh, regulatory requirements. So those things don't get pivoted that much <laughs> because uh, they, it's tough there, you know, especially uh, if you um, want to build knives or, you know, that, that or beds that treat people. But Inside of uh, uh, that bioscience industry, uh, you see people trying to make new machines, cytometers, new reagents, new um, experimental processes. And that's sort of where we come in. I mean, we can uh, help them uh, look at better ways to do data visualization. We can help them uh, connect their data from their uh, acquisition software to, to their lab. We can uh, help them organize uh, the lab material. Um, there's a lot of ways, because in some ways, uh, bioscience is an in, in old industry. <laughs> uh, and it flourished me a little bit uh, when I first uh, uh, started working with them, because uh, it feels like while everybody else uh, in the world, in every other industry has kind of moved on, uh, the scientists are still uh, suffering from very primitive stuff. <laughs> uh, it, it is, uh, yeah, me laugh. So <clears throat> there is tremendous amount of opportunities um, to innovate uh, in bioscience. I think it's exciting, uh, even just from a software standpoint. But I imagine, um, you know, if you're figuring out new ways to identify, you know, uh, cells or identify things, those are even bigger innovations. So yes, um, and there's some older stuff like, you know, heavily clinical regulate, regulate, regulated stuff that's, uh, that doesn't, that doesn't get changed <laughs> if at all. So, yeah. So Rick, what I'm hearing is that um, it sounds like with the bioscience sector, um, in particular, the BD collaborators or clients that you work with, um, there's opportunity for change. They're open to it, but there's also um, another level in which they're not. Actually, maybe we can connect um, individually because I actually collaborate with BD and I do cytometry mm -hmm. and we're trying to innovate something new. So I'd be really interested in connecting with you. Sure, I, I, um, I'd be happy to, yeah. So I think, um... Uh, I think we'll have uh, your contact information after this. I'm not sure we name, but yeah, we'll be sure to, to reach out. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. Okay, good. Um, so we have a question from Lynn, and he's asking, how do you find some clarity on the pivot in a time of uncertainty like now? For example, 
we might think that a sector like large events might mean my business is dead, assuming I provide a service to that sector. And so I need to pivot. There's an uncertainty on what large events will look like due to governments. So it's hard to predict where to look for opportunity. How do you think your way through that and find a pivot that is justifiable? Right, so, you know, um, pivoting, uh, one key thing is it, it's gotta be somewhat evidence-based, you know, and uncertainty um, introduces a lot of doubt, which we all kind of deal with, um, but um, in situation like if you're doing event planning, all right, and you don't know uh, how the world's gonna, gonna be, in some places, it may not uh, be the right time to pivot because, it, it, you know, for um, uh, events that you think eventually will pass and that you can weather through it and that the conditions will return, um, pivoting then would make basically mean that you have to pivot back. <laughs> uh, so so I, I get the, the clarity um, type of thing. So. Um, the the best scenario, um, the best sort of strategy that I can uh, come up with is to uh, be a bit more defensive. Um, your future, uh, uh, your future business model. So obviously, something like COVID changes everybody, right? We can see that uh, hotels are uh, taking a huge hit, and you know, co-working spaces are taking a huge hit. But we know that events will. Be needed eventually, whether it's uh, online or not, right? And so you can think about how to accommodate those things in the future. So it may not be necessarily a complete pivot, but like, okay, can I offer, can I come up with a program that does uh, virtual events well, right? And there are people actively trying to do that for conventions that are being canceled. How do you do those things? And maybe there's opportunity to providing services or even and products there. And that doesn't take you away from what you do, but it adds to uh, what you provide. And maybe that's, you, you identify this new segment of market that's potentially opened up or, you know, um, uh, that, that people are shifting the way that they use your service. So I think that's a great question. And uh, um, it's, it's always difficult to, uh, read the, the, the tea leaves, so to speak, but uh, um, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. But if you're talking about uh, events, I think people will need events. You know, concerts will come back, you know, whether uh, they will come back the same way or not, um, um, that's uncertain. But I think kind of thinking about guessing what people might, might do in the future. Um, we have a client that is uh, trying to build a, a software for virtual concert, uh, for virtual uh, comedy clubs uh, for, for comedians where, you know, it's not like this, where I talk into a camera and what they wanted to do is when people will laugh and react, the information, that sound audio information is synthesized and, and returned to the performer. And so they can gauge the, the room and, and the audience that way. Um, Anyway, that's maybe a little bit off the tangent, but think in those lines, it could be an exciting uh, way to think about ways that make sense to you and add to the services that you already provide and make your service even stronger overall. Great, thank you. And Lan, if you have anything that you would like to add to your question, feel free to open up your microphone and, and video if you'd like and, and ask it. Oh, he says, thank you. Great. Well, you, uh, somebody, <clears throat> somebody asked a question earlier, and Rick, you actually just brought this up. But um, in this day of Zoom conferences and things, is it hard to give a talk when you don't see the people you're talking to? <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's OK. Um, you know, I, I just try to imagine your reaction in my head. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, yeah. But I, I think, you know, I'm kind of old school. I still prefer 
uh, seeing people's faces and seeing their body language. And it's, you know, that's how kind of I, I try tend to collaborate with people. There's nothing wrong with doing things virtually, but it, it's something about in person that could never be truly replaced with virtual um, meetings. But uh, like I, re uh, I think I see this as a uh, functional way of communicating, but if you want to get to the, the heart <laughs> uh, or, you know, to, to people's uh, re real reactions, um, it's much better uh, to do it in person. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you there. Okay, well, uh, I don't see any other questions. So and if somebody has one, please put it in the chat. And in the meantime, we're going to put up just our post program survey, feedback survey, we would love um, for you to fill this out. And this just helps us when we create programs um, at the Oregon Bioscience Incubator. We want to make sure that we're creating programs that people enjoy attending. So Heather's going to put up the poll for that, I believe. Well, I'll, I think, oh, there it goes. There it goes. Okay, thank you. So if you, uh, if participants could fill this out, that would be great. And if anyone else has any questions for Rick, please put the question in the chat or just go ahead and open up your microphone and uh, do it the old fashioned way, the old fashioned new way. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rick. We really, really appreciate all of your great information and new ways to think about changes that we might need to make to our business or what we're doing in our lives that we perhaps hadn't thought about before or, um, might need to start thinking about, especially with such a massive change as like what's happening right now. I think yeah. a lot of pivoting is happening. And, you know, um, any of these, I mean, I, I know I went through this super quickly. Uh, any of this can be stretched out to another <laughs> presentation, but hopefully, um, like I said, you know, a lot, we have very diverse audience here um, mm -hmm. and it's it's difficult for me to really zooming on one use case and speak more in depth, but uh, I'm happy to connect with anybody who uh, wants to reach out uh, to us and um, talk more specifically about uh, their, their project they're working on or problems they, they may have. Um, hopefully, yeah. you know, um, the, the talk, uh, there's still something there you can take away anyway. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Darren is asking if you have a recommended book or other resource for early stage startups that are looking to maybe to validate a product concept or move to the next stage or do fundraising. Do you have any recommendations for him? Yeah, so um, I'll, you know, I'll come up with a few instead of just one or two. I'll come up with, I think there are uh, three books that I would, I would recommend now some of this information um, may be a little old, but you, you kind of have to extrapolate a little bit. Uh, but I think the general principles still um, still are, are right. So um, so you, you said, Darren, uh, we'll, we'll send you uh, uh, some information that we can look up. Great, great, thank you. And if, um, if everybody could finish taking the poll, we're gonna get that closed in just about 30 seconds. We really appreciate your feedback always. And um, unless anyone has any other questions for Rick, I just want to thank you so much for presenting today and for IQ Lab for sponsoring today's program. We really, really appreciate it. Um, there will be a recording that um, will be sent out later this afternoon to all everybody who registered. So you'll be able to rewatch it again at your leisure. There will just be a link to click on for that. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. And we appreciate everybody who has attended today. And we hope you go forth and have a wonderful day, the rest of your day and the rest of your week. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.